All right, well, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, the title of the lecture tonight is <coughs> Critical Disturbance, One State After Another. Um, so the image you're looking at is, this is the, it's my interpretation of the, the lakeside daisy. Um, the lakeside daisy is an endangered plant. Near Lake Erie in the Marblehead Quarry remains the sole American colony of the rhizomatous heliotropic Hymenoxy ocalis. The lakeside daisy takes root in the cracks of limestone formations called alvar pavements. They're not named after Mr. Alto. But <laughs> in two weeks, when the colony blooms, thousands will celebrate the event with brass bands, perch sandwiches, and cabbage rolls. The lakeside daisy site and spectacle lies in the intersection of culture, ecology, and art. In the case of the daisy, the abiotic, that is disturbance soil chemistry and quarry geomorphology, combined with the biotic, to affect an idiosyncratic landscape within the Great Lakes biotope. The lakeside daisy spectacle begs questions of normative ecological theories that privilege the form and function of higher order stable systems. The daisy is rare, rural, and fugitive. It troubles notions of ecological restoration, to fill the hole, to restore the devastation of the quarry, to heal Mother Earth would destroy the daisy's habitat, and subsequently the daisy. Rarity in current stewardship and conservation ideology begets preservation and conservation. To cultivate the daisy is to disturb the daisy. The clock of succession must be periodically reset. Managers of the daisy's preserve must forever simulate the act of quarrying to maintain the daisy's habitat. Tonight we will discuss the notion of critical disturbance in site work. A site-specific practice of critical disturbance arises in the intersection of several fields, the nascent discipline of urban ecology, experimental geography, process and earth art, and the devastated landscape genre in contemporary art. I will discuss recent shifts in theories of both urban and disturbance ecology, ecological aesthetics, and site-specific practices, and how these theories offer a framework for both landscape interpretation and site work. Finally, I will discuss the notion of latent rarities in sites around Columbus by speculating how disturbance can be engaged as both a progenitor and actor in guiding the emergence of idiosyncratic landscapes and ecosystems. Let's see. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna do some, some vocabulary here. <laughs> this big word is anthropogeomorphology. Anthropogeomorphology is defined by geologists as the study of humankind's impact on an alteration of land. In the words of Matt Coolidge, for every pit, there is a pile. For every pile, there is a pit. For every heap of architecture, there is a terrestrial void. Ecological systems reorganize to accommodate the disturbance of earth moving, and humans respond in kind with more disturbance tactics and regimes to manage this process of reorganization. The term anthropogeomorphology encompasses both the study of elements of form, space, and order of traditional design disciplines of architecture and landscape architecture, as well as the engineered, productive, extractive, and infrastructural manipulations of land that support human habitation. Framing the representation and interpretation of our surroundings via the ever-shifting relationships of ecology and anthropogeomorphology offers a nuanced and generative alternative to reductive binaries such as landscape and architecture or man-made and natural. This approach privileges an understanding of networks, flows, linkages, context, and ephemeral qualities over the discrete site or object. The Fever Fellow Brian Holland once suspected that Columbus was only one building. From an anthropogeomorphological perspective, this may be the case. Disturbance is defined by ecologists as an event or process that disrupts relationships within ecological systems. Ecologist Stuart Pickett defines disturbance as a discrete event in time that disrupts community structure through killing, displacements, or damaging of individuals. It is the disruption of one state that leads to another. Disturbances are spatial. We can read the traces of disturbance in landscape the clear cut, the path of a mower, the void of a quarry. Disturbances operate at many temporal scales. Violent releases of energy onto sites, wildfires consuming grassland, bulldozers leveling terrain, bombs dropped on cities. Longer term manipulations of site input, water, nutrients, and biomass will also disrupt ecosystem dynamics. Disturbance. So this is a diagram showing time. Um, on the bottom in biomass production going up, and you can see that ecosystems generally try to organize themselves to produce more biomass, but if you have a fire or wind throw event, that will drop 
production will drop. This also leads to a series of bifurcations in terms of the state of the ecosystem. So at each um, disturbance event, there's, you can read basically where the, where the event occurred and where the event did not occur. So you have bifurcations on the site. And this is a diagram showing wind throw within a forest. I use the term three, third ecosystems to refer, refer to novel ecosystems born of disturbance regimes and improvised in the traces of former industrial landscapes. The first ecosystem are pristine, complex wilderness ecosystems. Second ecosystems are muted, found on urban industrial sites. Urban ecologist Ingo Kowarik uses the term fourth natures to describe forested ecosystems that have evolved on urban industrial sites. Natures one through three include old wilderness or pristine ecosystems, traditional cultural landscapes such as agri and silviculture and functional greening are planted tree stands in urban areas. The notion of third ecosystems focuses on how ecosystem dynamics are shaped in relation to anthropogeomorphological substrates, while Kowarik's fourth nature privileges woodland succession dynamics. Ruderal. <clears throat> the ruderals are defined as a community of species found on anthropogenic and uncultivated sites, ruins and rubble heaps. In other words, disturbed sites. Ruderal's root is the Latin rudus, or waste. Ruderals are also known as weeds, pioneer species, or invasives. Rudal species colonize disturbed sites and provide the groundwork for more complex communities to emerge. To survive, the site must be disturbed again. Rudals live fast and die young. In decomposing, they provide organic matter to poor soils. Agricultural practices with their cyclical <clears throat> disturbance regimes are a means to maintain colonies of rudal species. Rudals suggest a means of site-based practice that begins with a given, to work from the ground up, to work fast, and adapt and iterate with minimal means. Contemporary ecological theory provides the groundwork for thinking rural. Three major shifts in the discipline of ecology occurred in the late 20th century. The emergence of the probabilistic paradigm, the development <clears throat> of the field of applied or restoration ecology, and urban ecology. The first was the development of a new paradigm of ecology that was probabilistic rather than deterministic. In the de deterministic Newtonian model, Scientists believed that nature's desire was to achieve a permanent climax as a balanced, steady-state superorganism. Such beliefs have led to wilderness preservation movement and its concomitant representation regimes. But the real world did not adhere to this deterministic ideal. Disturbance and recalibration were the norm, rather than the exception. Scientists discovered that ecosystems were temporal, probabilistic communities, or in the words of thermodynamic ecologist Dorian Sagan, they are not equilibrium dissipative, dissipative processes rife with stochastic elements. In other words, ecosystems are big machines that degrade high quality solar energy into a complex web of living beings. Entropy begets life. In succession, ecosystems pass through various states of organization, beginning with low biodiversity and high nutrient loss, and moving towards higher biodiversity and tighter nutrient cycling. Along this path, Succession processes are always vulnerable to random disturbances that cause systems to regress to simpler states. In landscape, we can read the patterns of disturbance or bifurcations in this succession process. Many process-driven landscape reclamation projects, such as Fresh Kills, project images of complex, stable states of healthy ecosystems as a 30-year goal. Such an approach disingenuously denies the probability of disturbance and fails to critically engage disturbance as a generative force for precipitating the unexpected. The emergence of the discipline of urban ecology in the 1990s marked the second shift. Normative ecology <clears throat> studies the relationship of organisms in pristine or wilderness areas. This comprises the majority of work done in the United States. Normative ecology is not interested in cities. They are too far gone for consideration. The ideologies of restoration ecology are closely tied to that of normative ecology. To restore an ecosystem, a pristine reference site must be selected for simulation. If no untouched sites are available, the restoration ecologist is tasked with reinterpreting the site to remove any sources of artifice. That is, to use science to create a reference image. The restored ecosystem is then a contri contrived image of an image, postmodernism lurking at the cattails. Urban ecology is the study of relationships between living organisms and their environment in the city. It embraces artifice and irony. Urban ecology is punk, not hippie. 
The discipline emerged in the post-World War II era as ecologists studied the process of recolonization of rubble by plants in post-Blitz London. The Berlin Wall, a political and spatial disturbance, also played a role in the development of the discipline. By containing the studies of ecologist Herbert Sukop, he simply could not travel farther afield and subsequently confined his study of ecosystem dynamics to the city. Urban ecologists investigate the material effects of political and land use changes and how these events recalibrate the relations between organisms. Urban ecologists look closely at the effects that human, humans have on ecosystems and study change along urban to rural gradients. Considering that half the world's population will soon live in urban areas, they have plenty to do. In the dialogue between science and art, it is urban ecology that leads fine art as a critical framework for engaging and interpreting the relationship between culture and nature in the 21st century. Landscape architects continually engage, imitate, and mis misinterpret the work of earth and process artists from the 1960s and 70s. Contemporary site-based and representational art practices, or ecological aesthetics, tend to suffer from awarenessness, that is, the gesture of healing the earth or framing sublimely disturbed landscapes with the arm reach goal, arm's reach goal of raising awareness. Photographers David Meisel and Edward Bertinsky document the sublime moments and landscapes of extraction industries. Supersaturated colors contrast with muted backdrops, provoking both awe and unease in the viewer. These elegantly wasted landscapes lack vegetative life. Gradients of salinity and deposition are framed by Meisel's aerials and mimic the work of abstract expressionists. As viewers to this spectacle, we are seduced and scolded in the same frame. A prissiness towards sight has emerged in the post smithson era, grounded in the sanctimonious assumption that artists, least of all, should disturb Mother Earth. In many cases, nature is brought into the gallery in the form of science fair-like microcosms. Mark Dick <clears throat> Mark Dayan's Newcomb Vivarium is a sample of the Pacific Northwest brought to the Seattle Art Museum, a green site, non-site. The terrarium houses a nurse log and its attendant colony of organisms. Phoebe Washburn's once promising accretive and perilous installations have given way to microcosms, such as regulated fool's milk meadow, installed in 2008 at the Berlin Guggenheim, coyly refers to Hans Hacke's 1972 microcosm entitled the Rhinewater Purification Plant. Once a vehicle for institutional critique, the microcosm is now a sustainability fetish object. The scale at which ecological art operates is its limiting factor. Scale and the lack of physical engagement with causes many works to list towards representation. This trepidation prevents operation and engagement at the scale of one-to-one. -to, -one. to engage both entropy and disturbance at the site scale at one-to-one, -one, not microcosm, is a radical proposal in our sustainability-obsessed era. However, Green River, perform performed in the late 1990s in cities in Germany, Japan, Sweden, and Norway, Olafur Eliasson and his team pour green dye into the river, temporarily making the river and its hydrodynamics hyperlegible. The work expands to the confines of the river channel and flows through the city, eventually dispersing according to the rules of fluid dynamics. In the meantime, spiral jetty lies exposed on the dry salt playa as it once was once submerged. Actors come and go from spiral jetty. Entropy is still made visible. In her book, One Place After Another, art historian Miwon Kwan traces the history of site-specific art from the avant-garde practices in the 1960s to the, genre, the genre's loss of criticality and co-optation as a tool of, of urban branding. Along the way, the term site itself took flight to be reconstituted in a site of relations between an artist, an institution, an issue, and a community defined by the artist and institution. A site-based practice that engages disturbance, as well as a network of relations between both plant, animal, and urban communities is a potential child of Kwan's genealogy. Disturbance, as defined in the natural sciences, defines site as well as state. State and site coalesce. Disturbance is both a spatial and temporal territorial act and marks before and after. Disturbance is placemaking. If disturbance describes nearly all human impacts on the earth, agriculture, urbanization, war, mining, then what constitutes a practice that critically engages disturbance? In land management, a distinction is made between critical and subcritical disturbance. Ecologist Josiah Clark defines landscape maintenance practices, mowing, weeding, etc., as subcritical disturbance regimes. 
A critical disturbance is that which destabilizes the ecosystem and shifts site systems into a process of reorganization. I would like to introduce three contemporary projects or reference sites that critically engage disturbance as an actor. All three projects began as disturbed conditions on a gradient from green to brown to white, a former rail yard, a drained lake bed, and a degraded salt flat, from the biotic to the muted, and emergent biotic to the abiotic. This is uh, Sudgalanda. Sudgalanda, south of Berlin, a rural forest has taken shape as the result of post-World War II political restructuring. East Berlin's Reichsbahn cut off service to most of West Berlin, and the yards were abandoned. The disturbance regime of herbicide application was suspended. Carried on rail cars, species from many regions took root, creating a cosmopolitan plant community that has been studied not just for its idiosyncratic biodiversity, but also the cultural and historical factors defining the composition of the community. After the reunification of Berlin, the site was considered for redevelopment, but was set aside as a nature conservation area in order to preserve the large communities of rare plants on the site. To maintain the site for public access and continued research, a two-part plan was developed by Okulcon and Planland for the site. The first part establishes zones of public access, allowing visitors to explore freely in some areas and restricting access in others with rare plants and species that are concentrated in the grassland. Second, the site has an adaptive management regime that utilizes per periodic disturbance to succession disturbances to succession practices. So in this diagram, the site's basically divided into four quadrants that each have um, a different cycle of um, mowing or cutting. A visitor to the park is guided through the mosaic of different dynamics of play in a time-lapse journey through pioneer vegetation, rural perennial meadows, to groves and finally forests. The architectural elements, the boardwalk and follies, produce an experience of oscillation between signal and noise, at times inscrutable and open to interpretation and projection. In the Owens Valley in the Sierra Nevada mountains, a large dust control project has precipitated novel ecological relationships. In the 20th century, the Owens River was appropriated as a water supply for the city of Los Angeles. In 1928, the diversion drained the lake, leaving it a dry playa. Dust from the Alkali Lake Bed is a major source of particulate pollution including selenium, arsenic, and lead, and is the largest source of PM10 pollution in the United States. After many years of legal battles, in 1998, the city of Los Angeles began a dust mitigation program to irrigate 30 square miles of the playa. Here, catastrophic disturbance affects a landscape of air correction. The playa was reorganized into an irrigated moat and furrow landscape and is now home to brine shrimp, microbes, and provides migratory bird habitat. Complete restoration of the lake was impossible, the river provides half of LA's water supply. Pragmatism in this case results in a productive, idiosyncratic, and unprecedented landscape. Beta Laydown. The Bonneville Salt Flats is an intriguing site of study for the art of disturbance. It is a landscape reduced to three elements, crystal precipitates, water, and underlying topography, a distilled landscape for experimentation with readily observable effects. It is the site of absurd BLM-sanctioned juxtapositions, where geological time scales meet the hypertrophic realm of high-speed auto racing. The precedent is set for unconventional land use. Intrepid Mining controls 88,000 acres of potash production ponds in Wendover. Potash production involves pumping subterranean brines to the surface of shallow diked ponds, where suspended minerals precipitate as the brine evaporates. The mineral-rich brine is pumped from the aquifer below the Bonneville salt flat. This practice caused depletion of the salt crust of the Bonneville Salt Flats Raceway. In 1997, the Bureau of Land Management and former Bonneville Salt Flat operator Riley Industries began a pilot project to, initiate, to replenish the lost crust. By 2002, the Salt Laydown Project returned 6.2 million tons of salt to the flats. In the Salt Laydown Project, these solutions are pumped from south of I-80 and deposited on the raceway to the north. Intrepid Mining's potash evaporation ponds feature a land use signature typical of remote areas in the Intermountain American West, where topographic, geological, and ecological hydrological systems are disturbed and reorganized at a massive scale to serve the needs of the extraction, military, and waste management industries. During my residency at the Center for Land Use Interpretations Wendover Field Station, 
I located what is called the laydown manifold, the machine of the laydown project, a series of pipes that distribute brine into a four bay and allow the even distribution of brine to the target areas of the raceway. In the flats north of 80, I proposed excavating thousands of small craters of random depths and diameters, which would capture water in the spring during the laydown cycle. The field, would be the, <clears throat> the field would be visible to drivers on Interstate 80. Over several years, the intervention would be erased by the effects of wind, erosion, and redeposition of salts. Due to its nearly abiotic nature, the desert, in particular the Great Basin, has traditionally been a place to test anthropogenic disturbance, dispose of tox toxic waste, test munitions, and build earth art. This project plays in a loophole or surplus moment between a restoration machine and its target site. The craters refer to the pockmarked anthropogeomorphology of the Nevada test site and the Dugway Proving Ground. I would like to close tonight with a few proposals of demonstration grounds for a site-based practice of critical disturbance. Within the 270 Ring Road in Columbus, Ohio, are fallow quarries, rail yards, and abandoned and leveled factories, sites of anthropogenic disturbance. Over the past year, I've traversed these sites, inventoried their geomorphology, plant communities, succession patterns, their historic and contemporary disturbance regimes. I have mapped and named the landscapes and spaces that comprise these sites. A gallery exhibition called The Monuments of Columbus, developed with students from Knowlton, established a site and on site relationship between these sites and the institutional art community. I'd like to discuss how these sites might act as demonstration grounds for the theories I have outlined this evening. The parent or reference site for this project is the Olentangy Wetlands Research Park. The others include the Tribu Quarry and the Salt Mountain. The Olentangy Wetlands Research Park was created through two major acts of anthropogenic disturbance. A poorly drained cornfield to the north of OSU campus was recontoured to create pools. The site was divided into a control pond and an experimental pond. One pond was planted, the other not. Ten years later, the pools are nearly identical. And the Olentangy Wetlands Research Park was designated a Ramsar site, a wetland of international importance for bird populations. An urban wetland habitat of significant scale is a rarity. The Wetland Park has a scientific mission, provides a living laboratory for Ohio, the Ohio State University, and allows for recreational access. All the things we ask for are in our landscapes today. The two other sites offer similar possibilities, but are held in a stage of stasis due to legal issues due to their status as rail and mining sites. As such, they have been relatively undisturbed and exhibit patterns of reorganization and recolonization and succession. Within the longer time scale of recolonization, there is an opportunity to disturb and redirect flows on the site to create novel landscapes of rarity, as in the case of Sugaland and the Marblehead Quarry. At the Trebu Limestone Quarry, students Matt Kellogg and Dan Beer proposed res <laughs> resurrecting the act of blasting at the fallow quarry in order to create a landscape of vernal pools a habitat essential to amphibians for reproduction. Vernal pools are rarely found in urban areas, and populations of amphibians have dropped considerably. Kelling and Beer also proposed to redirect the creek that currently skirts the quarry in order to flood the plateau of craters each spring. The topographic profile of the pools would determine the, the composition of plants at the edge of the pool, from an alkali wetland to a cliff edge. Both rare plant and animal species would be found at the site, in addition to this disturbance regime, Kallig and Beer imagined a trail system that would traverse a series of landscapes and monuments within the quarry, including the Tipping Forest, the Rubblescape, the Limestone Wasteland, and the Accidental Wetland. The Salt Mountain is a stockpile of road salt visible from I-670. This monument is at times clothed in a seductive black vinyl cloak. The mound constantly changes shape as salt is added from rail cars, and winter weather demands de-icing of roads. Students Matt Bond and Brian Ashworth measured salinity levels of runoff water on the site and found levels to exceed that of the Great Salt Lake. No dikes or other structures prevent this bittern from entering the city's stormwater system. At the eastern edge of the site, a former rail yard and roundhouse, a stand of gray birch and poplar typical of abandoned rail yards has become established. This site is yet another node in a series of experiments whereby surpluses and inputs are manipulated to create novel systems. One day last week I visited the site, I saw a flock of avocets, 
birds rare to Ohio that favor salt marshes. With the salt mountain in our midst, we have the opportunity to harbor a landscape unprecedented in central Ohio, a salt marsh, using the same tactics of the redirection of water used in the Olentangy Wetlands Research Park. From the hypersaline core, following a gradient to brackish and sweet, a transect of rail ha rare halophytic communities will emerge, framed by the sublime monuments of disturbance. This is the plan. These sites are just two of, the, of many surrounding downtown Columbus that offer possibilities for a Berlin-style revitering of, an ever, of ever-evolving monuments and wilderness just a short bike ride from campus. If the work remains speculative, imaginary, so be it. These sites paused in transition are the grounds of imagination, rarity, projection, and inscrutability. Thank you. So the, the question is, what's, what's the new language? Yeah, what's the, what's new, the language? new language? How can I escape, you know, contradicting myself on reviews? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, for me, it's the idea that, you know, time is, time is only moving forward. And maybe it is, it is time to take away the word, the prefix re. So restoration or reintensification or reinvigoration, but actually to look at, to look at sort of what's, what is available, where we are now, and what, how we can, can um, recalibrate or sort of reorganize what is there in order to bring something into fruition that we had not yet imagined, right? So that it isn't, so in that way, yeah, thinking about it in terms of, of disturbance as a series of disturbances and reorganizations, um, I think, for me, it proves to be a more profitable way of, of thinking about site. Does that answer your question? Yeah, but you used reorganization. <laughs> <laughs> okay, new organ. I know, see? <laughs> Contradicting yourself. <laughs> Mr. McMurrow. I also very much appreciated the talk and this notion of the productive use of disturbance, but I guess I just want to pry a little further into the ideas. And you made this point about the microcosm work mm -hmm. as being trapped in the logic of representation and so couldn't engage logics of performance. And, and I think in the three projects you conclude with, I understand the point. I understand mm -hmm. the point of trying to get to these larger productivities. I guess what I'm trying to understand is not really a contradiction at all, but I'm trying to understand once these novel conditions, so like the salt marshes in Ohio, mm -hmm. like, I don't know, there's something about what, what is the kind of measure of that productivity once it's implemented? Because at some level, like also in the Berlin project you were showing, the, there's a kind of novelty in its occurrence, mm -hmm. which is also still at the stage of the Microcosm, population. right? Yeah, it's still at the stage of the microcosm. And so I'm just sort of curious, I know this work is early on, like how would the productive ambitions get you out of the microcosm, or is it um, endemic to the conception of these? <laughs> Well, yeah, I think that by nature, just defining a site or creating a site is 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 one act of, you know, is it is 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 putting it in the gallery almost, right? And and defining what the 
you know, what are the substrates or what are, what are the flows, what are the inputs, um, those all have to be, con you know, considered and then uh, manipulated or to bring about rarity in, in, in some cases. Um, and it does, you know, it does, and that's the, I think that's the thing that I'm struggling with is, is that then it does it become that demonstration ground? Um, or, or is the idea that creating something that's rare have a value in, its, in and of itself as a, as a landscape and among, among a field of the banal, I guess. <laughs> So, and just what does that mean to have, like, to, to create that sort of rarity through, um, I don't know, site physics, I guess, I would say, as opposed to, as opposed to the way that um, one might go about sort of de designing, designing it as a landscape architect by, um, you know, choosing, choosing what types of materials to use or what, or what the overall metaphor is, and is that, Answer at all, <laughs> but yeah, I do. I do think that the microcosm issue is is, is pervasive, and as, as something to, to kind of keep going back to and testing testing these ideas against. Mr. Brabs. Um, well, I noted noted that a lot of the were, uh, were all the drawings that you showed today your own work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. marketing work, when we see photographs of projects, why did you choose to represent the work that you're talking about this way? Well, it's, you know, it's sort of two, twofold. One is that, one is that it was a chance to kind of look at, look at the work of like Robert Smithson or Barry Lavaugh, um, Oliver Eliasson, and, and do sort of models or tests of the diagrams of, of that work. As it means to, as it means to, move towards a, a way of working materially with those, um, with those elements, is in, just in the way that you know representation, representation is one of the ways that we get to, actual work. Um, so that was, that was the 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 part, I guess the the, um, that was one aspect of it, and the the second was, that. Over this year-long process of, of, of investigating this, um, investigating this topic, um, I felt that I didn't quite have a, a, a means to, to, re, to represent it just yet. So I was sort of developing that visual language of, um, of getting my head around that idea, I guess. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, and I mean, it also is, you know, to take a break from Obviously, to take a break from showing uh, showing work in a way that um, you know, with photographs that are highly polished and highly rendered, to really, I guess, underline the fact that this is still in the very conceptual phase, right? <laughs> Catherine. If there are too many questions are being dominated in this <laughs> Well, that's why I left a lot of room. I left a lot of time for questions because you know it is. This is all new stuff, and I'd like to have. This be a, a discussion. discussion. Yes. So, make room for other pointers soon, but I just adding, sort of following up on this conversation, um, this idea of how you represent the representation becomes very interesting because if you, of course, think about the whole history of even just the word landscape mm -hmm. as a representation and the encoding of that of that term and then the encoding of design process onto the world um, relative to the line that you're, you're walking between, or biking, uh, <laughs> or driving sometimes while claiming from a graffiti covered van. Um, <laughs> that, that line between the sort of art world realm and the the more hippie realm, the <laughs> punks versus the hippie, uh, the, the save the world realm. So I'm, I'm thinking about this sort of other language that's emerging out of that, that you seem to be poking at. And um, also your then citation of, of, of course, various land artists and then Yuan Quan, who, who sort of has a critique of the idea of, of community 
Mm -hmm. I mean, this is very much a sort of a semantics conversation that you've introduced, and um, she, she questions the whole semantics around that word, community. Right. And so by trans, starting to translate that into that kind of border zone uh, between, say, the, the ecology of happenstance or the ever-evolving ecology and the sort of insinuation of, of design, where, do you see that starting to itself become a critique or, or itself start to engender new communities and possibly pull off the critical element of, of the community or to reinsert the word community in a new way? that might be trans-special trans as much as right. trans-racial with all of its sort of associations with colonization. I'm sorry, that was really long. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> well, there's, I mean, the, there are, yeah, there's colonization and uh, <laughs> a lot of discussion of colonization and community. Um, are, you, are you asking about how these, sort of these demonstration sites would be uh, engaged by by a user group? Is that is that the type of community you're talking about, or is it a more? Well, I'm wondering because it seems like you're engaging in a new kind of community, right? Which is uh, not necessarily purely human. Mm -hmm. and, and so I'm, I'm thinking about that sort of encoding that has happened in the art world of the word community, mm -hmm. and also in the design world in a very different way, as we've discussed. And so I'm, I'm just curious if this sort of community becomes becomes a new thing around. The so maybe, yeah, I mean, it, I guess part of it is considering my, um, the implications of this approach is to, uh, is to become a, an actor, a sort of a, an actor, and organizer that um, sets process into motion, but is uh, involved in, involved in a, you know, 30, 30 year project of, of changing, changing parts of it and um, curating, I would say that that process. So it's not, I mean, it's definitely obviously a critique of, you know, this idea of, you know, we're going to set the stage for this amazing thing to emerge and at the end of 30 years it's going to look like the Photoshop rendering we, we sold you because, you know, that, that to me just, you know, once that's set in motion then we're, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't account, it doesn't account for natural disturbance that's going to happen anyway. Um, and so I'm thinking about sort of, uh, what's the word? <laughs> uh, becoming an actual actor in that process. And I mean, it's done all the time, of course, with you know, pruning and mowing and controlled burns and that sort of thing. But to, um, I think to, to, to maybe just expand that, expand that um, way of working with the land um, uh, specific to certain sites that have you know, maybe the, the ability to turn themselves into something that is, that is rare and unprecedented. Question in the back? Um, I guess in the, the reference site of um, Sudgaland, I was thinking more of the in that project that there's there's a field of you know a field condition and certain um, certain disturbances happen in certain places to kind of cult to, to cultivate certain areas. So there's you know one area is kept as meadow, another area is let just let to you know go, which is in this diagram here. So it's it's a way of um, kind of marking and working with a site through targeted um, 
targeted disturbances that operate at different, at different scales. So not everything gets wiped clean every year. You know, certain areas would, the, 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 um, there's you know, almost like a recipe that is uh, adaptive. Like in this, in this one here, the, uh, does this thing work? So in this, in this case here, this is, you know, multiple disturbances. And this one, this one has more feedbacks that comes down through here, right? Does that answer your question? So it isn't just to sort of let it go and then hit everything with Roundup and then start it again. <laughs> but it would be, you know, <laughs> scripted applications of Roundup, shall we say. <laughs> Any other questions? Charisma. And I was wondering if you've um, given some thought to these ideas about the city as a whole and uh, an ecosystem and how that might inform. Uh, well, Howard, Howard Odom, H.T. Odom, is um, with his sort of energy, his energy modeling or his thermodynamic model of, of ecosystem dynamics uh, definitely ad addresses the idea of, you know, the city as a whole and it's, you know, where it's, where its energy budget comes from. Um, and I think that, you know, I think, yeah, those, those two ideas are definitely, definitely in play. Um, and that with the work of, of the urban ecologists, you know, out of the last, you know, 20 years, um, they're, they're really looking at ways that, I don't know, it's, it's that, that uh, ecology can be int intensified um, within the city and to not make judgments based on, you know, is this plant an invasive or is it a native or, you know, is, and not, all, not all land can be inhabited, not, not everything can be parks. So there's, I guess there would be two scales to that. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Mr. Gotthardt. Do you want spiral jetty up here, just, just in case? <laughs> Well, I think maybe just site, site right? I mean, and then of course, site-specific work is, you know, is run off, on, off the rails too. Um, well, I, I think in the, the way that I'm uh, reinterpreting a lot of the land art projects um, in my research is to look at, not so much look at the formal, so the formal issues as much as what is, you know, the, 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 the idea of working at the scale of one-to-one. -one. You know, it's not as much about, okay, we. We're not doing stuff on the gallery anymore, but what, is it, what does it mean to actually manipulate, manipulate sites? And I think there's been, you know, definitely, as I said in the lecture, um, a real pulling back from, from that kind of work. I mean, even though Roden Crater, um, which is in the desert, and City, Michael Heiser City, they're still, you know, those are 30-year projects as well. Um, but I guess one of the things I'm also, I've also been, Investigating is, you know, just the notion that the desert as being less biotic than other, or considered to be, you know, less less green than other parts of parts of the world. That that's always been a a site of, um, for testing. 
So not only of land art, but also you know, munitions or it's a place to store toxic waste. So this, the idea that you know, some landscapes are already devastated means that you can, you can do things to them, right? Because they're not, you know, they're not set up on the mantle. Um, and so those, those are some other ideas that um, I've been sort of trying to develop is what, you know, what sanctifies a uh, landscape versus, you know, what, what gives us the, um, I don't know, let's, let's just feel like it's okay to, to start digging holes or drop bombs. <laughs> Mr. Holland. Sure. Uh, so, that's what this is about. I'm just uh, get the discussion going. It's, it's interesting to think about architecture within this framework that you're putting forward, which is ostensibly about landscape architecture, but you expand it to include art and kind of social practice as well. But if I think of architecture from this framework, it's a kind of um, anthropomorphic. <laughs> Anthropogeomorphological? Anthropo <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. How would an architect like, find value in action within this kind of frame? Well, I, I think the, the line of questioning that I'm following in the, it, and basically casting all architecture is you know, anthropogeomorphology, right? It's all just, it's all just taking, taking um, stones and soil from, from somewhere else and reorganizing it and, and, and concentrating it, right? And that's how an Right, so sort of that, that material idea and, and um, part of it is a way to kind of back, back out of, you know, kind of recent practices of whatever green building or green roofs or green walls or, you know, corn on the roof or whatever it is that we're doing and actually um, think, think, about, think about ways that we really can engage these things so that they don't become the microcosm again. Does that answer your question? Any other questions? I have a, one last. Yes. As we're thinking about these questions as related to landscape architecture and design, there are two terms that kind of kept coming to me. One is control, and one is kind of mining the landscape. Um, how do you see this as design, when basically design often wishes to impose strict control on the interventions that we do. Whereas mining our bigger landscape to identify these anomalies, these little treasures to, do you encapsulate them? Do you protect them from like the salt marsh? Do you protect it from getting real fresh water so it doesn't change? What are your thoughts about how that progression of control and really identification of place as a means of design, or is it design? No, oh, it's absolutely design. I mean, it's absolutely an interventionist. It's an approach that is, you know, an interventionist practice. Um, whether, you know, whether it means, um, you know, redirecting, redirecting those inputs, like dumping, you know, the, the example of, the area downtown by the, behind the Nationwide Arena, there's you know there's really big stockpiles of, of earth um, for future building, and um, you know there was a one of the students in our studio proposed you know a way of, of kind of redistributing that material um, and setting up setting up kind of a framework for succession and disturbance um, based on that. But absolutely, it's absolutely it's design, and and you know there'll be you know, the, in, in, in these projects, um, you know, access, access is part of it. It just, I feel like it's, um, I don't know, if it, it, it's maybe a way of being um, more adaptive um, in terms of, of working on sites through time and not, and not trying to, not trying to always preserve things. So the question of, of you know how do you how do you maintain something that's this rarity that may only occur for a, you know a six year period or a three a three year period and, and making those and making those decisions um, 
it's you know it's more of a like I have a friend who's a land you know a land manager and that's that's what he does is he figures out you know what what goes fallow and and what what lets what do you let grow and what do you mow so yeah I definitely think there's I mean that's called management but I would call it design I guess anybody else well thank you all for coming